Hi, this is Tzvi Rosen. Uh, now that we've discussed modules a bit, we're going to prove two important module theorems and discuss some of their applications. The two theorems are Cayley-Hamilton and Nakayama's lemma. And then we'll see applications after proving both. Before uh, presenting the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, we should start by defining a free module. And a free module is a module, uh, well, let's let A be a ring so we know what ring we're talking about. And a module, a free module is a direct sum indexed by some index set, not necessarily finite, not necessarily countable, just an arbitrary index set, mi, where mi is isomorphic as an a module to a for all i. a finitely generated A module uh, is going to be equal to a quotient of some free, finite, finitely generated free module. And we'll see that now. So we'll recall first that a finitely generated module is one that can be written as uh, the sum over some finite index set of a times xi, where each of the xi's is a fixed element in the module. For x1 through xn in our module. And these are called generators of the module. Okay, so a finitely generated free module will be of the form, well, looking at what freeness means, it can be written as a direct sum where each of the, uh, each of the summands is a isomorphic to it to the ring. So if it's also finitely generated, then we can just consider it a copy, a, a direct sum of finitely many copies of A. Or you can also think of this as A n. I guess just by definition. Um, okay, and if you have um, a finitely generated module which is not expressible as, uh, which is not free, so you can't just consider each of these modules isomorphic to um, the to the ring A. Then what you can write is um, we can think about an, a homomorphism. So let phi from A n. to M map generators of A N to the XIs, the generators of M I of M. Okay. And since M is can be written as a sum of the AXI, that's going to be surjective. So a n quotient of the kernel of phi will be isomorphic to m. And that tells us that m is going to be a quotient of a free module. So a n mod kernel of phi will be isomorphic to m. Okay. Now we arrive at the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. So we're going to let m be a finitely generated a module. Let a be an ideal of A, 
and let phi be an amodule endomorphism of M, that means a homomorphism of M to itself, such that phi of M is contained in A times M. Okay, so that means elements of M that can be expressed as a, as a product of elements of the ideal A multiplied by elements of M and finite sums of those. Then phi satisfies an equation of the form phi to the n plus a1 phi to the n minus 1 plus up to a n equals 0, where the a i are in this ideal a. And this is the version that we find in Atiyah MacDonald. Um, and it should be reminiscent of a, another Cayley Hamilton theorem that I'm sure you all have seen in linear algebra. So if instead of finally generated A module, we're talking about a K vector space, and we forget about this ideal inside of A, because ideals in K vector space are not, a, are, the ideals in A are, in uh, a field K are not particularly interesting. And if you let phi be, so we forget about the ideal, and we let phi be a K linear map from m, this vector space, to, to itself, then phi satisfies an equation of the form p a of phi equals, etc. equals 0, given by p a of lambda equals a determinant of lambda i minus a, where a is a matrix representing phi. Okay, and this is the characteristic polynomial of a matrix that you're familiar with from linear algebra. Um, and this is the more familiar form of Cayley-Hamilton theorem that a matrix satisfies its characteristic polynomial. I mean, or, or a matrix can be plugged into its characteristic polynomial, uh, and the equation holds true. Um, so here we have some some extra extra layers from uh, from ring theory, but really it's we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about the same thing, and the proof is the same. Uh, before we go on, here are the Cayley and the Hamilton of the theorem. So uh, this is William Rowan Hamilton, famous for the quaternions, and he proved a version of this theorem for quaternions uh, in 1853. And this is Arthur Cayley, and he verified the theorem for three by three matrices in 1858. And he ha and there's a snarky quote in Wikipedia, which uh, I'm not sure is a real quote, but maybe, and uh, certainly funny. I have not thought it necessary to undertake the labor of a formal proof of the theorem in the general case of a matrix of any degree. So for us, it is quite useful to think about it for a matrix of any degree. But uh, for Cayley, 3 by 3 was enough. Uh, and the, the, the actual theorem in its general form was proven by Frobenius later on. Uh, but here's a proof of Cayley-Hamilton. This is the proof that we get in... Um, Etienne MacDonald. So we start with, um, we know that phi applied to m is contained in this ideal multiplied by m. So given that, we can write for any, since m is finitely generated, so let's list out the generators of m. Generators of m, we'll say, are x1 through xn. So if we have phi of xi, uh, let's make it xj actually, this will be equal to sum of aij xi, where i goes from 1 to n, and uh, all of the aij's are in the ideal a. Okay, and then the reason this holds is pretty obvious. If uh, any element can be written in terms of X, the xi's, then uh, we should be able to express uh, phi of xj in terms of elements of the ideal times these generators and add it up with each other. All right. So this is for all j. So putting all of this on one side of an equation, we can have phi of xj minus the sum aij xi equals 0. 
where i goes from 1 to n. And I can, I can stick this inside using this trick with the um, Dirac delta. So you use this delta ij to say it's 0 except when i is equal to j. And so we're going to make this look like at the following. So we have i equals 1 to n of delta ij phi minus aij times xi. Okay, This is equal to 0. And now we recognize that this is basically a matrix equation, right? where you're looking at a row of a matrix, which is given by delta ij phi minus aij. Um, that's the row of the matrix. And then the vector that you're multiplying by is all the xi's. So continuing the proof, we, have, we now have a matrix. And we have a construction that we can make for a matrix. So, so for any matrix A, let's use a different term because A we're using for the ring, so let's make it B. There exists a B tilde called the adjugate matrix, the adjoint or the adjugate of B, such that the adjoint times b is equal to the determinant of b uh, times the identity matrix. Okay. So multiplying both sides of this equation by the adjugate of the matrix that's indicated by these by, by this formula, we obtain the determinant of uh, delta ij phi minus aij equals 0. Uh, and, and here you're allowing the, the, both the indices i and j to vary. But then we can just treat this as, ma as, a, as a true matrix and think of this as the determinant of phi times the identity matrix minus aij for ij. Um, and I suppose we should apply this, this can apply to the vector of x1 through xn. Um, this is going to be equal to the zero vector. And, uh, and if you expand out the, this polynomial, So this gives us a polynomial of the form demanded by the theorem. OK, so really what the proof boils down to is multiplying by the adjoint matrix um, and observing that the result is, is the 0 operator. And now we have this, uh, this uh, elusive uh, polynomial that any endomorphism phi satisfies. OK. Now we move on to Nakayama's lemma. And let's state Nakayama's lemma as we find it in, uh, in Tn McDonald. We're going to let m be a finitely generated A module, and A an ideal of A contained in the Jacobson radical R of A. Then Am equals m implies m equals 0. Okay. So recall the Jacobson radical. This is equal to the intersection of all maximal ideals of A. Okay. It also has the property that for any x in, or it's the set of elements x, such that for any y in A, 
1 minus xy is a unit. Okay, these are two equivalent characterizations. So having an ideal contained in this Jacobson radical, if it, if it uh, doesn't uh, affect m, meaning if, if m stays the same after multiplying by that, then that must mean that m is the zero module. Okay, and here's a picture of Nakayama from the Mac Tudor website. Uh, he published the general form of, of Nakayama's law in 1951, but there were earlier versions that, con that contained some part of it. That, so sometimes we'll see this referred to as cruel Azamaya theorem or the Azamaya Jacobson theorem, um, but most people call it Nakayama's lemma. Okay, so here's one proof presented by Atia McDonald, and for it we'll require a lemma. If we let M be a finitely generated A module, and A in A is an ideal such that AM equals M, then, th then there exists an X in the ring, which is congruent to one modulo the ideal A, such that XM equals zero. Okay? And let's prove the lemma first. So we're going to use a direct application of the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. So let's see the statement again. So we, have, we want to have a, an A module endomorphism phi, which is contained in AM. And uh, phi must satisfy, an, th then we will conclude that C, phi satisfies an equation of this form, OK? So our. Um, our endomorphism will be the identity. Let phi be the identity. Okay, so obviously phi of m is equal to m, but that's equal to am by the hypotheses of the theorem. So what that implies for us is that phi satisfies an equation of the form phi to the n plus a1 phi to the n minus 1, etc., down to a n equals 0. And this is a consequence of Cayley Hamilton. Okay, this is Cayley Hamilton. And well, if phi is the identity, all of these maps are just the identity which tells us that we're looking at one, the identity map one plus a one plus etc plus a n must be equal to zero, the zero operator on this, on this module. Uh, and that tells us that if we take this to be our x, it satisfies the, what we want. So x equals one plus a one up to a n satisfies the lemma. Okay, and so that's that's the x we're looking for. So now we're going to go from there to the proof of Nakayama's lemma. So we're going to take x from the lemma. Which, uh, which we know it is, uh, satisfies x congruent to 1 mod a. And xm equals 0. But because a is contained in the Jacobson radical, this implies that uh, any element in A must have this have this unit property that uh, one minus x y will be a unit for any y in the ring. But that means so if we take x and we subtract one, that's zero mod a. So that tells me that um, 
So we know x minus 1 is in A. But if we take y equals 1, then by, by the definition of the Jacobson radical, or the alternative definition of the Jacobson radical, we have 1 minus x minus 1 times 1 equals, okay, so just 1 minus x plus 1, so that's x. That has to be a unit. That means that there's an x inverse. So this implies that exists x inverse. So uh, we can multiply x inverse by xm. And by properties of modules, this has to be equal to x inverse xm, which would just be m. But we know that xm is going to be the 0 module. So this all is equal to 0. And that tells us uh, that the whole module is zero, which proves not Kamen's lemma. Okay. Uh, an alternative proof is presented in Atiyah McDonald, and this is a proof by contradiction. So we're going to suppose that M isn't the zero module. Okay. Well, we know that M is finitely generated. So M is finitely generated, and AM is equal to M. Okay, these are both provided by the lemma. So this means that I should be able to write any element in the module as a sum of elements of A times elements of the module. So um, let's take a minimal set of generators of the module. Okay, so if, since the module is not zero, there's going to be some non-empty set of generators. So we want to take a minimal one, so there shouldn't be any redundancies. Okay, we'll name them x1 through xn. I'm sure you had trouble guessing that. Um, <laughs> so we, we should be able to write so since am equals m, we should be able to write xn as a1 x1 up to an xn, right? Because these are supposed to generate uh, the whole module since am is equal to m. Now we're going to get all of the xn's on one side of the equation. So we have. 1 minus a n times x n will be equal to a 1 x 1 up to a n minus 1 x n. But we know that a is contained in the, in the Jacobson radical. So since a is contained in the Jacobson radical, Lord help my fracture font, let me try the a one more time. It's a little better. Um, OK, so this implies that uh, 1 minus a n should be a unit. Uh, so this is a unit in a, and that implies that um, if I multiply both sides, so let's say b n equals 1 minus a n, let's call it, just call it b. So b equals. 1 minus a n inverse, then that tells us that x n is equal to b a 1 x 1 up to b a n minus 1 x, this should have been n minus 1, x n minus 1. And that tells us that x n is already generated by the other genitors, which contradicts our previous assumption of minimality. So by that contradiction, we conclude that this must be the zero module. Now we're going to discuss some immediate consequences of both the Cayley-Hamilton theorem and Nakayama's lemma. Uh, and these are all uh, taken from uh, David Eisenbud's Commutative Algebra book, um, which is a great resource for 
a lot of these basic results. Okay, so first consequence of Cayley-Hamilton is about surjective endomorphisms of a finitely generated module. So if we have a ring A and M a finitely generated A module, then if we have a surjective homomorphism alpha from M to itself, then it's an isomorphism, okay? So if, if you're thinking in the linear algebra frame of mind, this is telling you that a surjective map from a vector space to itself is also injective, and that makes sense because if you, uh, because of the Rankine nullity theorem, but this carries that over into, uh, into module theory as well. So instead of thinking of M as an A module, we're going to think of M as an A adjoint a T module. So consider M as an A adjoint T module where the action of T is applying alpha. Okay, and then we're going to define a module, an ideal of A adjoined T generated by T. So let I equal uh, the ideal generated by T. Since uh, w what we do when we multiply by t is we apply alpha, and since alpha is a surjective endomorphism, that implies that I m is equal to m. Okay. And now we can apply uh, Cayley Hamilton theorem where we take phi to be the identity. So let phi equal the identity, okay? And again, applying phi gives us something inside of I m since I m is the same thing as m, okay? So that means that if we apply Cayley-Hamilton, this implies that one, the identity morphism, endomorphism, plus some multiple of t, let's call it t times some polynomial in t with coefficients in a um, is going to be equal to zero, okay? Uh, just by the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. Then what that means is that uh, t times minus q of t is equal to one, the identity homomorphism. So that tells us that alpha composed with minus q of alpha, whatever this operator is, is going to be the identity, which means that alpha itself is invertible, so it must be an isomorphism. Okay, and that just comes from an easy application of Cayley-Hamilton theorem. Okay, here's uh, another consequence of Kelly Hamilton from the same corollary in Eisenbud. Uh, now we're going to use the same setup. A, let A be a ring and M is a finitely generated A module. If M is isomorphic to AN, then any N element set of generators forms a free basis. And what we mean by a free basis here, this is um, a set of generators with no relations. x1 through xn such that, uh, let's put it this way, the sum of axi, uh, this is just the same as the direct sum or the, just the n copies of a. There's no relations among the xi. Okay. So given this definition, so how could we prove this, um, this theorem? Okay, so here we want to observe that we have a surjective homomorphism from A to the N to M. So this is the one that just takes 
any element in the ring a n, so it sends beta of a1 through a n to the set of to the linear sum of uh, the gen these uh, generators of m. Okay, and if they indeed generate the module, this is surjective. This is a surjective homomorphism. Okay. So what we want to do next is use the fact that m is isomorphic to a n. So m isomorphic to a n implies that we have some isomorphism. So there exists a map gamma from m to a n isomorphism. OK. Well, okay. given this isomorphism and the surjective homomorphism from a n to m, we can compose these two maps. So let's do. First, we can do gamma, and then we can do beta. Okay, so then gamma followed by beta is a map from m to n to m. Okay, since both of these are surjective, this is a surjective endomorphism. And by the last uh, consequence of Kelly Hamilton we saw. This implies that beta gamma is an isomorphism. But if you have this isomorphism, that implies that beta that uh, beta itself is an isomorphism. which means that this map taking uh, the, the tuple, the n-tuple of elements of A to a, the sum of the AIXIs, that must be injective, meaning that there's no relations. Means that x1 through xn is a free basis. So whenever you take a, a set of generators a set of n generators of your module, this theorem tells you that um, there'll be a free basis. And so taking the size of your free basis as a definition of a rank of a free module, um, this notion tells you that that's going to be, th this argument tells you that's going to be unique. OK. Um, so that was a couple of consequences of, Ke of Kelly Hamilton, which I think are interesting. And now we can look at uh, a consequence of Nakayama's lemma, um, which some people have as, as another version of Nakayama's lemma, but I, I think it's a bit more concrete for us to consider. And this involves pulling back generators of a quotient module. So we're going to let i be an ideal inside of the Jacobson radical, which is uh, an ideal of a. And m is a finitely generated a module as in Nakayama's lemma. Then if m1 through mn in m have images generating m modulo im as an a module, then the collection of elements m1 through mn generate m as an a module. OK, so we don't know that these, to, we don't know at the start that these elements are generators of m. We know that after we pass through the quotient, they generate this quotient, the quotient module. So pulling them back, they'll also generate the module itself um, as an A module. OK. So to prove this, we're going to define um, a module n, which will be the quotient of m by everything in the span of 
uh, of these mi's. Okay, so it'll be the sum of a mi, i goes from one to n. Okay, now we wanna consider what happens to um, this module when you uh, pass to the quotient. So if we take n mod i n, that's going to be the same as m mod i m together with these elements. But we know that these this span is equal to, well, th they will generate m mod i m as an A module. Okay, th these m i's generate m mod i m as an, as an A module, and that tells us that this is actually equal to m. Okay, but when you quotient a module by itself, that gives you the zero module. So we have n mod i n equals zero. That implies that n equals i n. Um, and we know that n is finitely generated since it's a quotient of m. So n is finitely generated module. And it's a quotient because it's a quotient of m. And we have the early, the, we have Nakayama's lemma, which says that if i n is equal to n, then that implies that n equals zero. Okay? Because i is contained in the Jacobson radical. But that means that m modulo this sum of elements is zero, which tells us in turn that m is equal to the span of these elements. Okay? And that proves this either corollary or version of Nakayama's lemma. Okay. So hopefully you found uh, this presentation of Kelly Hamilton theorem and Nakayama's lemma interesting, and uh, I'll see you for the next lecture. Take care.